On this channel, we often talk about the fact that Disney prices have soared to an astronomical level. All the while, the parks seem to be degrading and degrading, even though they've said they're going to spend $60 billion. By the way, we're hearing $85 billion on the back end. Upgrading their parks and trying to turbocharge them into the next phase, we struggle to think that they're actually going to put that on maintaining the existing parks. Let's talk about why so much money is being made at the parks, but Disney refuses to keep Walt's legacy alive by maintaining them here on that park place. Hello, I am Jonas J. Campbell, an investigative reporter for that park place. And here with me is uh, Mr. Vashka. Vash, are you ready to talk about some financial shenanigans? Oh, I am always ready to talk about financial shenanigans because you know what, Jonas? These parks that we love so much, they need money. And it's very unfortunate that uh, things have not been going well on that front. Yeah, we got asked a really good question on TPP Live the other day, and there's more before we get to that. But uh, the continuous thing that comes up is Disney is making money. I don't want to say hand over fist. Uh, they were making money hand over fist at the parks. Uh, there was a period not long ago when 70% of the company's revenue was coming specifically from the parks, bearing in mind that Disney Plus was supposed to be the thing that makes this company profitable, and they bet their entire futures on that. And Wall Street said, yes, yes, go for str streaming subs. Please go for streaming subs. There's a whole lot of damage that was done by Disney Plus that we could probably get to on another day. But of that 70% of revenue, we hear that 30% of the entire revenue for the company in that year came from Walt Disney World. But we also see a lot of issues at the parks where maybe not so much money is being put into maintaining those cash cows. Old Bessie is being put out to pasture and uh, and and she's got to live with the runoff from uh, from Disney Plus getting a full uh, full feeder there. And uh, poor Bessie is out there starving. Uh, Vash, is my analogy apt? I think your analogy is apt because uh, usually Bessie would be fed properly uh, for how much well, milk she produces. And unfortunately, that is not what is going on. And it's terrible. And it's yeah. awful. I hate it. And it, uh, a lot of people, you know, they, they'll ask us like, hey, you know, what is going on wrong with the parks right now? Why aren't they investing more money into them? You know, why are we seeing things cut to the degree that we that we see them? And uh, I think our answers provide to this super chat really go into a lot of that. Yeah, uh, well, I'll also add, and just in case you all think that this is a pet issue here, Lightning Lane, which we are all of the opinion that Lightning Lane has essentially destroyed the park's experience. Uh, probably Genie Plus and my Disney experience has, has done more damage than anything to the parks themselves here. But uh, Walt Disney World is about to raise Lightning Lane attraction prices for Tron, Guardians, and Seven Dwarfs. Uh, just pointing out here, this is a minor increase right here. See? See, it's a minor increase on the mine train. Anyway, Seven Dwarfs Mine Train at Magic Kingdom is going up a dollar. Tron Light Cycle Run going up a dollar. And Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind. These are the passes that you have to buy on top of Lightning Lane Multipass. I, I don't know if you can get individual Lightning Lane or Lightning Lane Single Pass as they've now uh, rebranded it without Lightning Lane Multipass. But, but here we are. Uh, they have almost returned to the e-ticket system, but they have priced as if you are allowed to ride all the rides uh, with impunity here. Uh, I, I think Tron Light Cycle Run, that just went off of Virtual Queue, and Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind still on Virtual Queue, and uh, they're essentially saying, if you want a guaranteed spot on this ride, if you don't want to be in the lotto, you better pony up some dough here. Uh, that's a very, it's almost as if uh, Rocket Raccoon and uh, Peter Quill set that up themselves. Vash, why? <laughs> well, they have to have quarter over quarter, year over year increases. And the only way to do that is to really up the price on what they currently offer. If you can't actually, you know, add to the roster of services that you can sell to guests. Uh, this is this is what we're seeing here. We're seeing a, a kind of a cap in terms of in terms of how much revenue can actually be generated. So this is why you get these kind of increases. I believe there was a Yahoo Finance article actually going into this a little bit with some analysts and experts. And they're saying, well, that's why they're investing 60 billion dollars in order to justify these increases for so long until those new attractions and so forth materialize, well, you're, you're going to have to increase prices even without that. That's going to be dangerous territory. If they had been on a constant investment loop like they should be, well, that might not have been as big of an issue. 
Yep, and that's a great point. So let's get to the panel discussion that we had on that Park Place Live and the excellent super chat that inspired it. Uh, Walter Tomaszewski for four ninety nine. Why did Disney's parks and rides become more expensive the more decrepit and flat out broken they became? Did no one plan for any maintenance and replacement? Uh, Vash, you want to respond to this one? Yeah, I mean, well, you you had the company enter into some c- severe cash flow issues with the uh, start of the pandemic. And having to shut down, you know, Disneyland, for example, for four hundred twelve. No, no, no. Uh, was... they, they, hey, hey, they were not. They didn't have to. Iger requested. I, oh, I, I, that's true. Yeah. That's, that's very true. Yeah. I mean, it was all you know. A I, lot of those were self inflicted wounds. Iger put them in that problem, yeah. <laughs> which is a stunning, stunning revelation, mm. as was uh, recently pointed out by the New York Times. But I. Uh, I, that that was, uh, I think, a big driving factor there. Also, too, there was a, there was less emphasis placed on the maintenance and the uh, cost expenditures associated with the parks, and a lot of those cost expenditures, uh, or at least that that investment, that level of investment that Disney would have otherwise made, got dumped into streaming. So that's the, that's the thing. This albatross around Disney's neck right now is affecting all divisions of the company, but a lot of it being parks because you would normally dump a lot of those profits year over year gains. I mean, just huge increases in revenue when it comes to the parks uh, experiences division. You would usually dump a lot of that back into the product itself. Instead, they funneled almost all of it towards streaming. And that's where you get to this real bind here where you're kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul. And, well, you know, Paul's a deadbeat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why we get rid of we got rid of Paul Pressler, if you remember. Mm-hmm. Ooh. <laughs> that's, a fair Ooh, point. that's a very good point. And, and it's one of the reasons that uh, Nelson Peltz joining with Jay Rasulo, who, by the way, Jay Rasulo, a controversial figure, to say the least here. Um, he was a guy that was known for being very direct. And it's very difficult when that is when the when the note is he's hard to work with. Well, Bob Iger has too much of a focus on Disney nice, which is indirect. Uh, uh, One of the reasons Bob Iger might be struggling so much, in fact, with the CEO process is he doesn't want anyone actively saying that they want to be. CEO of the Walt Disney Company, which I, I think is patently ridiculous. I feel like that is a uh, a statement that hampers conversation uh, in reality. Can I, can I ask a question? Mm-hmm. It, why does Bob Iger's preference matter? I thought this other knucklehead that came in, the the the, the hired gun for the institutional investors, for lack of a better way to describe James Gorman. I, I wouldn't describe him what? as a what? knucklehead. I would I would describe him as the uh, adult in the room. Well, they're forming a succession committee, which I'll be joining, so I'll be able to... Well, of course, that clip actually reveals the lies that were being told behind the scenes by Iger and the existing board, because they supposedly had already put together a succession committee and <laughs> were well underway in their selection of the new CEO. So, uh, but no, regardless, um, he's coming in there to give the instu- institutional investors what they want in the form of a CEO. And I don't think he's particularly mindful of whether or not they are pursuing the job or not. The question is, are they going to give deference to Iger? Do you believe that's true? I don't. I'm not sure they want to end up with another, um, what they consider a bad choice, would, which I don't, uh, which was Chappick. Chappick wasn't the best to Parks ever. He was a bean counter from way back. Uh, but he did reestablish some form of accountability with DMED, which, guess what, Iger promptly removed, and a very senior ranking uh, uh, person of color from a position of authority that also oversaw DMED. So I, I, I'm not sure that Iger is going to get the quote unquote deference that he's looking for when it comes to the selection. So why does anybody care that's part of the selection committee? I'm just curious. What do you think? Uh, well, I, I think it's probably what you suspect, that that Bob Iger is in actuality the one who's going to be putting his thumb on the scale. And they might be saying, they might be putting lip service on the idea that he is not running this selection process, but he's he's mentoring everyone, which I think after the last process, that that is clearly not a positive for anyone who's actually been paying attention to what's gone on with Bob Iger since around 2018 uh, I think he he lost the plot about seven seven eight years ago, and yeah. and since then has it's become a legacy play, and not a Walt Disney legacy play, but a Bob Iger legacy play. And, and if it if it ends up being the person who serves Bob Iger's interests the best, or what he perceives as his own image interests the best, then they won't be a referendum 
on the profligate spending and the fact that they keep buying other companies that that are uh, well just expensive for for lack of a better term o- overpaying for fox by perhaps a factor of three times um when when it all is uh, said and done and basically being a worse off company than when they were from a stock price standpoint than when they were before they bought uh, Fox. This is a guy who I, I get it. I get it. I understand why he is recognized as one of the greatest CEOs of all time. But that is because he is one of the greatest communicators or, in in my opinion, deceivers of all time, because he is he is able to convince everyone that all of the good things are his fault and all of the bad things are someone else's fault. So uh, I don't know. I think it's going to be Dana Walden uh, because that's going to be the most diplomatic and- um, effective choice for him, but uh, Oof. what do you think? That that'll destroy the company. I mean, honestly, I mean, if, as, as effective as Iger's been in running this thing into the ground and making it, you know, uh, you know, monotheistic, uh, the, the 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 way that it's become, um, I think Walden would ju- uh, will deliver the coup de gras. I think she'll just basically she, slay the company. She will, and she won't. It, it won't even just be that. Bob will still be in charge of the company through her. Bob will oh, still yes. have his hands and everything. She will essentially be a puppet CEO and he'll be able to still continue to preserve his legacy or what he perceives to be his legacy until the day he dies. They'll go on walks together over there in their Brentwood estates. Uh, <laughs> it will absolutely be the, the the entire company because I think Dana Walden has definitely shown that she gives maximum deference to Bob Iger and his vision and the way of, you know, of him and, and his way of doing things. Uh, but uh, we we have heard reports internally that she has sided with a lot of, let's say, losing causes within the company. And yeah. uh, that great, that gives great pause oh. to a lot of her decision making and, and, and how she evaluates those decisions. Go ahead. I think you'll you'll see her keep Kathleen Kennedy on. You'll you'll see a whole right. bunch of the same stuff that has failed over and over again, continuing to be championed. The company will never change. The Honestly, at this point, anyone that Bob picks is just going to be the Bob Seipel in this situation. He's going to be able to continue controlling whoever he picks. Dana Walden is just a, you know, I think it would be very easy to sway her more so than it was to sway like a Chapek or or even a Damaro or someone like that, uh, because she is essentially him as a woman. And think about the conversation actually kicked off the, the super chat i should say that kicked off this entire conversation uh this funneling of the parks resources back into the studio i uh, don't expect that to change under, under dana walden i think that would be actually accelerate this whole 60 billion dollar plan that they have you know it's all predicated on well if a ceo who was actually selected maintains that plan and output or they just have you know their 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 own aspirations and 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 you know, guiding principles and so forth. So uh, it, it just it, it all it all I think it's it all comes down if 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 Walden is is chosen. And also, too, like, I mean, you know, you look at look at Jennifer Lee. She was just demoted. Right. I mean, could we imagine a Dana Walden being like, you know what? We actually do need more phys- uh, female representation at the top of these ranks. Let's go ahead and promote her right back on up. And, uh, you know, Pixar, ah, it's been it's been a boys club for far too long. You know, I can see the long here we are being made. And here we are mm-hmm. on that, and, and, and Pixar is going to come up here in, in just a little bit. But mm. the, the fact that this is uh, a continuous issue here of, of the denial that something needs to change, the insistent that the insistence that all oh, these outside metrics that have nothing to do with the quality of the work are what produces a uh, a better company. Uh, Ubisoft is is also in this instance where they say, no, we're not pushing an agenda, but also they have these. Uh, statements that are very clearly uh, agenda driven and, 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 you know, anything can be an agenda. But in this case, they're talking about immutable characteristics as an agenda item for personnel, which how that doesn't uh, run into employment law and and run afoul of discrimination standards in the United States is beyond me. Um, Well, we've spent a lot of time on this super chat here, but I'm going to try to sum up the, the spirit of what's going on here. They realized the parks were a cash cow. And they they could use all of that cash in order to pay for a transition of one of their separate cash cows that they knew would be dying and transition that into digital. While they were doing that, they also found ways through Genie Plus to raise that. And they needed that money so badly 
And they saw such little effect from lack of spending on keeping those parks up that they started to wonder, can we take a little money from here? Well, nobody noticed. Can we take a little money from here? No one noticed. So it's the fact, um, I'm going to toot our own horns here. It's the fact that AWDW Pro didn't exist in the form that it did in 2020, or that park place doesn't in, it didn't exist in the form that it did in 2020. That people were not focused on all of this because they were drinking that Disney Kool Aid. Kool -Aid. So I'm not going to say it's all us, but at least there's someone shining a spotlight that is not just uh, craving cupcakes here in order to uh, to be in the good favor of Disney. It's the fact that we can shine a light on them and say, hey, guys, you need to do better, Senator. Thanks for watching That Park Plays News. For more information, consider checking out www.thatparkplace.com. And don't forget to subscribe, share, like, and send this out on your favorite social media accounts.